everybody. Welcome to Marvel Champions Monthly, a fan podcast about the card game Marvel Champions. I'm Kennedy Hawk, one of your hosts. I have three awesome co-hosts with me today. I have Americano. How's it going, Americano? It is going great. How are you doing? Doing really good. Feeling quite um, alone today, and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> we got Crimson. How's it going, Crimson? Hey, everything's going good with me. Perfect. And we've got special guest Corey. How, how's it going for you, Corey? I am doing all right. Thank you pretty late for you we appreciate you coming on with our uh, very last minute midnight hour notice so this is gonna be great looking forward to it so can you tell people a, a little bit about yourself and your relationship with marvel champions and and what kind of uh resource you provide the community i'll give you that as a prompt all right thanks yeah so uh, my name is cory i go by insmith bear around my discord board game geek wherever you find me but um basically i started marvel champions probably last fall or summer i just picked it up because i was interested looking for something to do during the pandemic uh, i found another solo league online and had a good time playing in it it was a um it was a smaller group at the time and it grew very fast and the person who was running it i think either got burned out or maybe some personal issue came up but um they stopped running it uh so when there was that gap and all that interest I decided, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So I picked it up, and what became of that is now the uh, Solo Champions League. Basically, we play Marvel Champions every week. We do five rounds a season. Each season, we get a new leaderboard, all sorts of stuff like that. But each round, you either are given the option of three heroes, and you're locked into one aspect, or... You're giving one hero, and you get to pick, and you get to pick your aspect, and then with a, with whatever villain and module we have for that round, you are challenged with how high of a score you can get. Now, one of the things that I try to use to separate us from other things, other groups doing things like this, is that we really do ask how well you won or how badly you lost. Because it's not just ranked in the order of 100% wins and then 90% wins and then 80% wins. You're ranked on a bunch of different categories that are then weighted to create a final score. So you're weighted on uh, your win percentage, how many turns you take. Your villain score is comprised of what stage you reached on the villain, how much health they have left between the villain and its minions. There's a scheme score, which is used to, or sorry, is determined via how much threat is on your main or side schemes, what stage you got to, etc. And then you get a hero score based on your personal hero's HP and any allies you have on the board. So basically, it's just like degrees of distinction to see how well you did. Because it's not just trying to win fast. It's not just trying to win and barely scrape by with your hero. It's trying to keep all of those scores as high as possible. And in doing so, you uh, get a higher approval rating. So the one way we go about keeping things interesting is the theme of the scoring is kind of like, think of a, a citizen in the city rating you on your performance. So they might be happy that that you took care of the villain, but you left a bunch of minions running around the city and now they're still causing havoc while you're just going away and getting the front page of the newspaper. So these ever watchful citizens are rating us at the end of each round and we use those scores to try and gauge how well you did. Really cool. Um, so I joined it last season, and I was just blown away by how organized and awesome it's been so far. Well, we are four seasons deep, just about to start season five. So that didn't happen by accident, but it did happen slowly. One of the coolest things I found is on the Solo Champions League server, everyone is super supportive of helping everybody else figure out the puzzle that is solo. And that's going to be today's main topic. We're going to talk all about different facets of solo play. And maybe as we go through that, we can talk about ways to sort of improve that citizen view score. Um, but <laughs> one thing I found is when I post a deck, I get a ton of feedback on it and a ton of criticism as well. And it's been very, very enlightening to see so many different opinions and so many active people in Marvel Champions. 
I, I think I just saw a meme, a champion's meme about that, where <laughs> where the hero defeated the villain, but then he said, "Don't worry, uh, the minion's still out there," or something. It was, and then uh, anyway, that that's what that reminded me of. Just disgruntled citizens running running away from these these lowly minions because you didn't you couldn't be bothered to take care of them. Exactly. I feel almost called out. That's how I play. I'm just like, oh, I can kill the villain. I'll leave like seven minions out. So that's yeah. the first. <laughs> then uh, that's what I've been doing, and my score has not been great because I'm leaving all these minions out, and I'm like, oh, eleven threat on the scheme. The threshold's twelve. It's okay. <laughs> I I I am I, I imagine. Um, Agents of Shield, I think it's season five or six, uh, where the it was the Russian guy when they defeat him, all the other robot or android, you know, henchmen just fall, they just die. So maybe maybe you can justify it that way, Kennedy Hawk. There you go. Well, in the show notes, we'll include a link to the Solo Champions League Discord server, and there's a website that you can log your first game on. I, I noticed that when I logged mine, you, you do three rounds each week or three three matches of a specific round. And then that second week you're in the spreadsheet, right? Then you're then you exist. Yes, yeah. I spent a lot of time on that Excel spreadsheet. So basically I give people three attempts for the obvious reason of the random number generator of the game. You don't know what you're going to draw as an encounter card. You don't know what you're going to draw as your starting hand. And all those things have huge effects. If you only got one and done shot at it, it's not really a great measure of how well you did in the game, I don't think. By giving people three attempts and allowing them to kind of take the average of that, I think it's a better judgment of how well you did. Totally. Well, let's get on to our interrogation of solo mode and talk about all things solo. So I've got six questions here that'll sort of, or topics to guide us through talking about solo play. So first, let's talk about solo versus multiplayer. What are the pros and cons of playing solo? What are some like advantages and some disadvantages when you're playing in a game mode that has less players? I prefer playing solo myself. Um, okay. I'm going to be honest with you. The reason why I play solo is I ain't got time for people. People <laughs> take so long to play. They, they Like, literally, if I could go make a sandwich in between the turns, I'm done. I, I don't have the ability to focus on it. I, I just I can't do it. So, yes, I prefer playing solo because I can play at my own pace. Makes sense. Four-player games can get super long. Um, I really like solo games for that reason, too, especially if, like, I've got an in-home office because the pandemic so i can just leave one game set up on my second desk and as soon as i tear it down i set the next game up so there's never a setup time for me and i don't have to wait until two of us can align schedules i just sit down and play and that's that's nice yeah and now i do i do enjoy two-player co-op i think that's actually where the game feels the best to me but 99 percent of the time i'm playing by myself What about you, Americano? What do you think about solo play? Um, so I had, when I first started playing the game, it was a lot of two-player, um, my wife and I. Uh, but life's been pretty crazy. So if I'm the most of what I've been playing recently has been solo, um, simply for that reason. It's, it's easier for me to just sit down and play a game in you know, 30 minutes. And if I lose really quickly, I can get a second game in, in within 30 minutes as well. Um, total <laughs> um but i prefer to have a second row and i have yet to try two heroes with um by myself so i i prefer to have a second player i think i agree with with crimson that for me i like it the best with two um but it's also fun to play solo because um i i mean for me i guess a lot of uh, superhero comics um, a lot of what i like is the team-ups um, but it's also fun to have those heroic um, issues or games where you're by yourself just going rogue or not even going rogue just just taking down the villain by yourself that's that's always fun too um, but definitely my preferred is two uh, two players I, i'm okay with three um, four is a long but I also, I, I do enjoy solo. I, I do. If I didn't enjoy solo, I wouldn't be playing this game. Let's just put it that way. 
You mentioned heroic and solo in the same sentence, and my brain just turned off. That's just such a horrible <laughs> nightmare. And what do you think, Corey? You you play a lot of solo, obviously. Do you dabble in any multiplayer too? Whenever it's uh, safe out there. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I play with my wife, and uh, I do play mostly solo, just obviously because of the league play and stuff. But I do think it's a little bit more thought provoking, I guess, to have to think about everything. When you play multiplayer, you can say, okay, you're going to focus on the villain, you're going to focus on the threat, and obviously we'll adjust that plan as things come up. But when you're solo, you're playing by yourself, you have to balance all of it. And I think it just uh, makes for a more fun experience, a more engaging experience. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good segue into our next topic, which is about general deck building tips for solo versus multiplayer. There might be some things you can do in multiplayer. Like you said, people can sort of specialize. You can have, I'm the thwarty character or I'm the attacky character. But in solo, you have to be a jack of all trades. So what are some deck building tips you found that things that you might not consider in multiplayer or you would consider in multiplayer, but you shouldn't in solo? So we'll go in inverse order and have Corey go first. Okay. Um, I might not be the best person for this because I am at the pretty low score on the solo champions league. But for me personally, I think allies are way more important in solo play than they are in multiplayer. While they are just as valuable, probably in multiplayer when you're in solo, they're like the one character you can lean on to take a hit for you or to, uh, thwart when maybe you weren't able to that turn. So I think, leading into leadership and leaning into having as many allies out there as possible. Like even if you're playing justice, you're going to want to try and get daredevil on the table just so he can pull off his abilities as well as cover some other functions that maybe a second player usually would. Nice. And then, uh, Amer Americano, what do you think about, uh, some deck building tips for solo? Um, when I deck build, um, I always start with the hero, and I look at their their kit and decide what that hero is lacking in. Um, so if I choose Hulk, for example, um, I think that Hulk's thwarting card is not very good. I think that there's a lot of people that think all of his cards aren't very good, but that's beside the point. I think he's really good at dealing damage. Uh, he's not good at thwarting, obviously. He's got zero thwart. Um, so I'm going to look for cards in the aspect that I choose, whether it's, even if it's not justice, um, that will help me with my thwart. So I, I look for, I mean, that's the number one thing. And maybe it's obvious, but to choose, um, it doesn't even have to be the aspect to fix that, that character's or, or to fill that character's gap, but cards specific to helping thwart, for example, in that, in, in the Hulk example. Makes sense. It, so I, so those are the first cards I'll go for. So if I don't choose Justice in a Hulk deck, for example, I'll look for those cards that will help, whether it's allies, right, um, with high Thor uh, values or um, some sort of um, card that will uh, give me reprieve. I don't have to switch to Alter Ego ever unless I get his obligation. Yeah, for for me, it's... Uh, so the way I deck build for single player, other than thinking about justice, because I'm always going to think about justice first, but other than thinking about justice is my most important thing is to shore up the weaknesses of the hero that I'm playing. Because unlike in multiplayer, so if I make a deck specific for multiplayer, I try to strengthen its strengths. So for like Hulk, I would try to do more damage, put in more damage cards and let my teammates pick up where I can't. But in solo, you don't have the option of teammates picking up, you know, areas that you're weaker in. So in that aspect, I very much go heavy into its weakness. So, you know, if I'm playing a person who's really good at doing damage and attacking, I shore up the weakness of thwarting with as much thwart as I can. And vice versa, if I'm playing a, a hero who's incredibly strong at, at thwarting and controlling the main scheme, I'm looking for damage cards, even if that means throwing in a haymaker or, or two. It, just because sometimes you need that extra damage versus you don't need an extra thwart card when he's very good at thwarting already. Makes sense. 
Um, I have three hints, hints written down. Um, in multiplayer, I typically don't pay attention to what villain I'm building against, but in solo, I feel like it's really important to know what villain you're going against and then to plan your deck around that. So if you're playing against Absorbing Man with Weapon Master and there's no minions, don't bring Relentless Assault. You're going to feel bad when you draw it every time. So the other characters might be more balanced than that. There's a couple minions, there's a couple side schemes, but you can look at the ratios and decide, do I need to bring minion tech versus thwarting tech? Um, the second thing I wrote for is avoid things that have player counts in them. So Spider-Man ally is really good in multiplayer, right? Remove 12 threat from a scheme or a side scheme in four player. That's going to knock out almost any side scheme in the game. He's still good because he's an ally, but to pay five and only remove three threats and then get that ally doesn't feel as good in solo. Um, and the inverse of that, under surveillance, right? It just increases that uh, threat cap by four. Well, that's way better in solo than it is in multiplayer, right? In multiplayer, that's just avoiding one turns like auto threat. But in solo, that could buy you four extra turns if you can sit in hero form that whole time. Um, and the last thing I wrote, and this I think is really important, is status conditions are really, really strong in solo. Um, in multiplayer, if you stun the villain, he might not attack once, but then Rhino is going to smash into three other people. In solo, if you stun Rhino, he skips half the villain phase. That's awesome. So pay attention to stun and confuse, and even tough, right? Tough is basically almost an inverse stun, right? You can just ignore the villain's attack for the most part. So status conditions, super key in solo. Yeah, going with that, your first thing you said, um, uh, what was I? Th oh, the Quinn Carrier, right? For example, um, it's it's a support, so it goes out on the table, but it's a unique card. So only one person can have it. So keep that in mind too. You don't have to worry about that is what I'm getting at in solo. You don't have to worry about yeah, that right. type, if, those type of re restrictions. If you're trying to decide between Quinn, Quinn Carrier and Hello Carrier, Quinn Carrier is almost always going to be better in solo because it'll match all those resource kickers and stuff. That's a good point. Cool. So bring allies, be versatile, and bring status conditions, and you'll win every game. Um, what are some game tape pl gameplay tips for solo? This might be the same as deck building, but what are some things that you think sets you up for success in a solo game? We'll start with Crimson this time. Um, for me, okay. So I think the most important thing to succeeding at a solo game is to get your resource mechanics out as fast as possible, even if it means throwing away some of your penultimate stuff early in the game. Being able to get a helicarrier, a mansion, a uh, Quinn carrier, any of those out early will allow the rest of the game to be more fluid and streamlined. So it is very important to understand that it is okay to throw away some very important cards early in the hopes that you get them back. Now, this will also tie into my um, how to enhance solo play later. Okay. You're leaving us, you're just going to leave us hanging? Yep. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go next? Yeah. Kind of. yeah. Okay. Um, I think that kind of, I think someone said it earlier. I, I think solo can be less forgiving because there's a lot more going on that you have to do yourself. So, so I think it's more vital than in multiplayer to get your board state set up, if, especially if your character is relies on that board state. Uh, Black Panther, for example, um, that he, he relies a lot on his, um, his hero upgrades, right? So it's, I think that those types of things, it's, it's, it's almost like the beginning, the start of the game, you really, really need to focus on getting the right key cards out uh, without, you know, you're going to have to mulligan probably harder in a solo game than a multiplayer um, in order to actually survive the first few rounds. Nice. What were you thinking there, Corey? Yeah, I think Crimson and Americano both hit the nail on the head. It's really about building that board. Those first couple turns, don't worry about damaging the villain. You'll get there. Uh, definitely get yourself in a state where you can uh, 
do some automatic actions, be it a beat cop or um, something like Quinn Carrier to generate a resource, that's going to help you more long term and it's going to make the next couple turns a lot easier. If you go all out with, say, using a, oh, what's the Iron Man card? The, uh, the one where you're looking for energy damage. Repulsor Blast. Yeah. yeah, so if you're like, oh, I've got this Repulsor Blast, I could just start off really good. Yeah, go for it. But you're probably going to regret it. You'd rather spend that right away. On <laughs> <laughs> you're rather going to you're going to lose some cards first of all. But you're going to rather have get a few tech upgrades out there, and then later on when Repulsor Blast comes back, you'll thank me. But arrogant Playboy billionaire. Exactly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Theme. Yeah, my, my tip was going to be um, very similar. So use all your resources at your disposal. And I think Americana, we've been talking a lot recently about using your health pool and the threat pool as a resource. So if you have to spend a turn in Alter Ego and it's going to make the threat go up, that can be okay in some solo instances. Probably not against Rhino because his threat mm. level is so low. But know what that threat threshold is that you're comfortable at and how much you think the villain can probably threat for on average. And you really need to play yourself right to the edge. Um, and same thing on life. Stay in hero form as long as possible and then make that flip at like exactly the right moment so that you have used that full like health pool as a resource. That doesn't help you win the solo league, but it does help <laughs> you win solo games. So, <laughs> so, so just on, on that note, um, it's almost like you're gambling, right? You're on a very thin, you're walking a thin line uh, because especially if you're playing heroic or something where there's more, you're going to see more status effects, more card abilities from the encounter deck that could, you could risk getting that extra advance or, you know, having the villain attack you a, a second time. So you, you need to be more, I think you need, because of that, I agree with you hundred percent. You just need to be more conscious of, you know, what, what type of game you're playing, how many um, cards are out there. I just think it's less forgiving in a solo game because of that. There's not someone else to help take that load uh, or block that attack or, you know, that can take that threat down. So, yeah, I think the, the card you just mentioned, Advance, is one of the biggest solo killers. So know where those advances are. There's two in the deck unless you're playing against Wrecking Crew or there might even be more like Mind Ray and things like that in Zola. So... If those two advances are in the discard pile, you can feel a lot better about flipping. If they're in the deck and there's only four cards left, maybe you want to stay in hero form for a turn and, and prepare. And you're allowed to look at the in the discard pile, right? The counter deck discard yep. pile. You just can't. You're not supposed to change the order. Correct. Is that right. Okay. Yeah, one of the ways I've been recently trying to learn how to use my health as a resource is with Spider-Man, right? Aunt May is super efficient. We always knew she was efficient. But with Spider-Man, you kind of want to stay in hero form until you're down to two health. Because you can flip, use Aunt May to heal four. She can heal you four at the start of the next turn, and you can get all the way back to full health with one flip. So you've really got to, like, walk that fine edge and hope the villain doesn't get a double attack or plan for the villain to get a double attack and get yourself down to two hit points so that you can, like, make the most out of your your flip hopefully that made sense i don't know I it definitely made sense that's how i use her perfect all right well the next topic is one that a lot of people will like to debate about hopefully which heroes and aspects or combat combos of heroes and aspects are best for solo play uh, <laughs> not protection to go first right there not, not protection oh i yeah, mean not protection but Although it's I, I getting think better. That, yeah, I, I mean, and I think it only will make it more viable with um, with the larger, when the card pool grows, but um, obviously I think leadership's the best um, because it's so versatile. I mean, it, it's about status buffs to your hero, but also y there's a lot of different allies. There, there's more allies in leadership, obviously. Um, so you can pick and choose um, the style that you want to play and have a more versatile deck if you're playing leadership. Um, yeah. I, or, or I don't even know. It doesn't even really matter what, which, um, which hero all, all, <laughs> I think all heroes are good with leadership, right? Uh, unless, <laughs> um, but, but 
I will say that um, I have had some really fun games, surprisingly. No, maybe not surprisingly, but with um, aggression, solo aggression decks where you just go right, you just rush the villain. Um, uh, uh, Spider-Man aggression has been really fun for me. Um, She-Hulk aggression. Jack Crimson, She-Hulk aggression nope. has been really fun. Solo, just just rushing the vi- the villain. So it kind of depends, but I think that leadership takes the cake on, and and really doesn't matter which hero. Choose your favorite hero, go for it. What do you think, Crimson? Um, so I personally prefer to go uh, strong attack hero with um, justice or go uh, very thwarty heroes with aggression. Which um, heroes would you consider are thwarty? Thwarty heroes to me are going to be stuff like um, I know it seems weird but like uh, Black Widow to me is a thwarty hero. Um, pretty much any hero who has good thwart Management, Doctor Strange is definitely a thwarty hero. Um, what you're looking for is you're looking for a... You're looking for a hero that has at least two thwart removal cards in in his kit. Or her kit. Um, for aggression heroes, it would be stuff like She-Hulk. You know, She-Hulk, I play Justice because... She does have a couple thwarty. She's actually, to me, kind of the uh, the middle ground because she has a couple thwarty stuff and she has some attack stuff. Uh, Hulk is a very attack hero, so I generally let you know go justice with him, preferably. Um, and that's just kind of how I like to do it. What were you thinking there, Corey? So when I first started playing, it was justice, 100 percent, always oh, justice. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, I've been coming more around the leadership. I mean, we are four thousand games deep in the league, so I've got a lot of data to look at. And leadership is just the most consistent for so many different standards, be it your win percentage or managing threat and minions. That's I. I mean, I believe it was. Uh, Americana that mentioned that it was just the better all around one. And it really is, but I have so much fun playing justice. I think Crimson nailed it with having an aggressive character in justice. I like having uh, maybe something like Iron Man. So you can really not worry about threat till it's almost done. So you can use some justice cards to clear it down and then take two off, ready him up, do it again, use the helmet to take another one. It really is something that, manages it because the biggest problem I had when I started the game was most of my losses came from the threat going out. That was it. Uh, I could manage the villain. I can manage my HP, but the threat would come via an advance or master plan or something. So justice is what I leaned on. And um, I probably still would. I will say the most fun deck I've played recently, which is definitely not the most efficient one is uh, Iron Man protection. Getting those protection upgrades on them was a blast. Yes. Yes. I love that deck. I love Iron Man Protection. I haven't talked about him for a while. Need some more love. You're missing I've never out. tried it. I've never tried it. You need to. Throw some tech oh, upgrades ener- and protection in there. Energy Remember? Barrier, Crimson. The best aspect card in the game. Oh, you're confused. <laughs> <laughs> So I would agree. Leadership is really good, right? It's it's good at thwarting because allies can thwart. It's good at attacking because allies can attack. And it's good at defending because they can just chump for you and then you take no damage. But I am going to shock Americano here. And I actually think protection is ready to be one of the strongest solo aspects. Are you and talking it, about leaked cards too? No, I'm talking about <laughs> oh, okay. the Quicksilver pack that came out. Oh, okay. and, and especially the card that came out in Scarlet Witch that can remove threat for protection. Yes. Protection that hasn't game, had a... Yeah, bait the switch. Protection hasn't had a thwarting event before, but now Protection in Solo has access to two cards that can put out Stunned after Quicksilver, two cards that can put Tough on yourself, and it's got access to attacks, thwarts, and defense events. So it's I think it's the only aspect that has access to all of those things. The only Believe thing it's not, missing have... is Confusion, right? Um, yeah. 
you and it's don't got, really need it if you're. It, I prefer to stay in hero as long as I can when protection. So exactly. So you stay in hero, so you don't have to thwart as much, but you can still have that bait and switch if you need it. The the there's pretty good cheap allies, right? You can get Clea in there to be like a constant jump blocker. I guess there's Iron Fist, so like a third source of stun in protection. So you can stun is so good. Yeah, you can get <laughs> seven cards that stun in your protection suite. And Didn't we talk about this though? You can get too much stun in the deck. Yeah, I don't know if you can get too much stun in a solo deck, right? You just spend the second stun as a resource. Maybe I don't know. Well, if you have the right, yeah, if you have the right cards in hand to to have them attack you, the villain attack you. Yep. And then I think that uh, in protection you get pretty good allies, but the basic allies are now good enough that you don't even need good allies in your aspect anymore. You can run Iron Heart and. Hmm. Miles Morales, and who cares what allies come in your aspect if your event cards give you stunning, some sort of thwarting, and some sort of damage. And I think it's it's like you were saying with the Justice characters, you need to have a, a strong attacking character, someone that can deal out damage like Captain America or Captain Marvel. Um, either of those characters can be really strong with Justice because they get access to all the things they need to shut the villain down and just keep yourself in hero form the whole game. Oh man, gross, I need to I go pull the deck. green cards. I need to go. Green green cards are gross. I need to, I need to go. I haven't even played with bait and switch yet. You need to. It's super. I, I know. I I'm gonna go build a deck right now. I've actually been this. building this crazy Spider Woman deck that puts tough on yourself using protection cards. Like she's got contaminant immunity, but then she uses um, what is it? Perseverance. Is that the one where you flip and you get a tough? Yeah. So put tough on yourself, and then use great responsibility from the core set to absorb all of the threat and turn it into damage, which just goes right into your tough counter. It's so fun. That's multiplayer garbage. We're not talking about that today. Um, our next question is, what villains and mods are most fun in solo, and which ones are most challenging in solo? We'll let Crimson go first. Uh, most challenging, I would say... I mean, I'm just, I, I, I still give up on uh, what's his name, Modoc, or whatever his name is. Uh, uh, Dude in the chair. Doomsday chair, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> that eight static threat on his side scheme. You're just yeah, like, I, ignore I, it, I, I guess. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's, it's literally horrible to play against. Um, I still, whenever I want to challenge, I want to challenge one of my decks. That's that's what I go after, and I lose probably ninety nine percent of the time because he's he's just so oppressive. Um, probably easiest is like stuff like Bomb Scare or, um, you know, Mass or Masters. Those are, those are pretty easy. We we played them for so long that we we just know them. Um, I do enjoy generally me. I personally go when I want kind of a, a medium, I'll either go like uh power leech or power uh the power drain, yeah, power drain, yeah. or I'll go legions of hydra depending on the villain. If if the villain's a hydra villain, I'll generally just throw legions of hydra in there. That can get pretty strong. Um, but I find it to be the most, most thematic, and that's generally what I want to go after is thematic. Nice. What scenarios do you find particularly fun or challenging, Corey? Yeah, the most challenging by far to me was mutagen formula in expert mode. Um, in solo, I was easily losing in two or three turns just from being overwhelmed by minions or whatever random encounter card would just... Uh, completely scheme out that was the toughest one for me but i have a lot of fun playing the um the other green goblin one risky business i think the switch up and how it plays is a lot of fun in solo to try and manage the uh, uh what are those tokens called i'm sure one of you knows um the criminal network token no what is it uh oh my gosh Exactly. Insanity um, tokens on one side. I can't remember the other side. Criminal enterprise? No, that's the side. That's the. That's in, yeah. That's the environment. <laughs> madness and madness. That's what it is. Is it, is it madness? <laughs> we'll look it up. We'll, we'll look it up. I'll look, I'll look it up right now. Okay, but anyway, managing that 
uh, new aspect thrown into it is always a lot of fun for me. I'm looking forward to playing more of that. Nice. I found anybody that's only got one threat scheme, like uh, or one one scheme level, like Rhino, can just be really brutal in solo because you can just lose so easily. I've had turns where I go from zero threat in the scheme into an advance, and Rhino schemes out, and I'm just like, well, GG's. Should have stayed in here for him, I guess. I don't know what to do. Um, uh, I think Mutagen actually can be really fun in solo compared to multiplayer, because in multiplayer, so many things come out that it's just really, really tough. Um, but in solo, you can at least mitigate that a little bit, because his health is low enough that you can punch through fast enough, or you can only worry about your board and not everything coming out on everyone else's board. Um, and there's a lot of player or encounter cards that affect all four players, right? All four players discard things until they find a goblin and stuff like that. Um, and I've found that guard minions can be particularly annoying in solo because in multiplayer, when you have a guard minion, there's three other people that can get the guard minion out of your way. So you can still stun the villain or get your damage through um, if you're the player that needs to be dealing the damage. But in solo, the worst thing that happens is you're like, oh, I got this, you know, heroic strike to deal six damage and stun Rhino, and out pops a Hydra guard that only has, you know, three health. So you have no way to get rid of him and hit Rhino, and your day is just doomed. So guard minions, yuck. Inf infamy. Madness and infamy. Counters. Thank you. That's it. I feel better now. What about you, Americano? What what scenarios are your go-tos for solo? So claw claw is still probably my favorite scenario to play uh okay maybe not maybe um i think it probably is king and i don't i actually prefer to play king by myself i like it two player but it just is such a long scenario that it's hard for me to get that one to the table with besides by myself which is kind of weird because that's not how it you it's not how it was designed to be wanted to to be played right um but um I think that I agree with Crimson that the static um, side schemes that come out, the the flat amount of threat on a scheme without not a per player, are I think there's a few that have like three, not three per player, but three. And so if you're not playing, um, you you've focused on your, you know maybe you're only your threat, your thwart is at two. It's like oh that's annoying. I have to. I have to actually get an ally out if I don't have an ally out to to help with that side scheme. Um, but I think regardless of if I'm playing solo or multiplayer, my favorite modular is um, right now is temporal. What is it? Is that what it's called? T Rex module. Yep. Yeah. I, I. I. Yeah. The T Rex. I just think it's fun. There's quick strike in it, which can be frustrating. Um, but there's there's nothing in there that you know stuns me or i think there's a couple i'm trying to think of the one that exhausts all the mini or all the allies you control I, I what was that card that's not in temporal i'm just saying like those ones those are more for me more frustrating than than f like a fun challenge because it's like like what you were just saying can you talk you, you get all this stuff set up and you're like i'm going to do this epic thing I want to do this epic thing, but now I can't. Uh, I don't like that in a solo game. I want Favorite. to be able to do those epic. Th yeah, yeah. Basically, it's like, why did I even just bother setting that up? So, uh, temporal doesn't do that. It's an easier one, but it. I mean, it's just. I think it's overall fun. Uh, it does. It does stun you um, if you get like the ancient warriors out as a boost. So that's why you don't play it with claw solo. Brutal. Because because you will get stunned if you you'll get with. stunned or exhausted or stunned again, yeah. So, all right, the yeah. last or second to last, I got a bonus question for you here at the end. If the second to last question is, if you could enhance the solo experience in one way, what would you do? We'll start with Americano. Ooh. Um. Secretly, I just play superhero music on my smart speaker when everyone goes to bed. And I play, I stay up playing solo by myself and just nice. listen to superhero music. So that enhances my play. I, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that, I mean, that seems like a good answer. That's, I'll take it. That's, that's, that doesn't happen all the time, but when I want, you know. I thought you were going to add a second player, but you didn't. So I'm, I'm proud. No, no, that's, that would break the rules. Okay. 
Rules be rules. Crimson, what do you think? Okay, so what I generally do, and this this seems weird, but whatever. I I've, I've been enjoying it, so you know, to each his own. Um, I've been taking all my resource cards out of the deck and immediately throwing them in the discard on turn one. What it means is that my deck is smaller, so I'm going to hit an, hit a bat, you know, an encounter card sooner because I'm going to be really shuffling sooner. It also means that I'm not capable of getting like my Avengers Mansions or my Genius or Energy early in the game. Um, but they're still in the deck. They're going to get reshuffled. It also means that I'm working as hard as I can to reshuffle that deck to go through as many cards as possible to get the deck to reshuffle so that way I can get those cards back in the deck. It's very weird, and it, it's, it's, it's much harder, but I've been really enjoying it. I would like to see them in the future, maybe in other campaigns, you know, as cards that are added into your deck during an encounter could be added into the discard so that way you're forced to do um re to to get the reshuffle before you actually get the benefit of those cards being added that's cool all right Corey, how would you in- enhance your solo experience all right yeah I, I don't want to sound like a salesman but i would check out the solo champions league just because if you're new to the game there's a lot of people there who can really help you figure out the bugs that you might be stuck on. If you're not doing there, there are people there who want help with the bugs they might be stuck on. Uh, Also, it sets up a challenge so that you would try something you don't normally do. A lot of people don't play She-Hulk, for example, and I'm going to force you to play She-Hulk sometimes. So there's that aspect. And then on top of that, there is a degree further than just winning the match. It's just taking the time to say, uh, I'm going to win this match, I'm going to beat this villain, but I also want to try and clear the board too, which is, I feel like, at least, a step beyond just the normal win-lose condition of the game. Well, that was my answer, so I'll skip myself. No, I'll come up with something on the fly. Um, yeah, that was a really good answer. I was going to say, if, you, if you're if you one of those people that uh, avoids solo because you get stuck on things, just ask for help, and people will give help, and, and you'll figure out how to really enjoy solo. Um, one thing I wish that I could figure out how to do in solo more, and I think it's about finding the right cards in my deck, is there's some heroes that really like to flip, like She-Hulk and Miss Marvel, and I find that flipping your hero is one of the most fun things you can do in Marvel Champions. It's just this really enjoyable thing you get to do with your cards that uh, for some reason resonates with me, but in solo I find I don't flip my heroes very much. So if I could find a way to be able to flip my heroes more, I would definitely add that to my solo experience immediately. Whether it was like an environment that increases the villain's attack, but maybe increases the thresh, um, the threshold for threat or something like that, I would, I'd find a way to flip as much as I can. All right, you can, the you last can bonus question. And confuse the villain. Yeah, I could just play Justice, but that's gross, yeah. Yellow cards are yucky. Yeah, yellow cards are yucky. I forgot, not gross, that's green. Um, all right. So if there's a person out there that only plays multiplayer and they've avoided solo for a long, long time, what would you say to that player to convince them to play solo play? We'll go with Corey first. It's faster. Uh, you can play a game. You can win or lose no matter what. It's only going to take you less than a half hour, most likely, unless you're on a really difficult run and you can just pick it up and try again. Uh, there's no explaining it to someone else. And you can really tweak your deck quickly because you play the round, you see where the issue was, and you can fix it and play again real quick. Nice. Crimson, what do you think? That was kind of my answer, too. Um, I'll, I'll go more into the tweaking part. Um, incredibly good part of playing solo is you, you can stop halfway through the game. And you'd be like, something's not working right, or something doesn't feel right, or something doesn't feel thematic. You can stop, you know, reset, tweak your deck a little bit, and, and get to that point that you're trying to get to. Um, That's blasphemy. I, I know, I know. Like, you <laughs> don't have to finish a game. Like, there's nobody there to, you know, be like, oh, this guy quit in round three. You know, just play it how you want to play it. Enjoy how you want to play it. And being able to tweak your deck on the, you know, just reset 
let, let's let's tweak this out. Okay, the, this this card doesn't work for me. It's not working the way I want it to. Get it out. Get something else in there, and keep going, and not have to worry about other people and waiting around for other people or judgment of other people. All right, Americana, what do you think? Those are really good answers. Um, no one's going to judge you. <laughs> I'm just. My wife doesn't judge me when we play, uh, but you, you know, if you make a mistake, it's okay because uh, while you might want to, you want to learn from your mistakes, you didn't know you made it. So you don't need to be embarrassed for trying something new. That sounds kind of weird, right? But, you know, you want to try some cool combo and it doesn't work out. So it's kind of like what Crimson's saying, but, but you're not letting your, 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 you know, the other players down because there aren't any other players. So I'm really going to try this deck um, and it fails miserably. It's not embarrassing because no one else saw it and they're not mad. No one else is mad at you because you made them lose. I don't know. Exactly. No one had to know that you lost. Except for if you're recording your plays on the league. Yeah, except if you're yeah, recording your plays. Yeah, it's just between you and recording. my spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> Coral, no. What I would say is that your losses are going to be a lot more painful in solo because you're all on your own, so there's no one else to blame when you lose except yourself for miscounting. But your wins are going to be that much more sweet when you win with one threat left before the threshold and you look at the next card and it was going to be advance. You can just know that you completely destroyed the game all on your own, no help, and that's an accomplishment. So, Also, also you can exaggerate your story because no one's going to know the difference. Yeah, I killed 72 minions and shot all of Hawkeye's arrows <laughs> in one match, in one turn. Exactly. I'm pretty sure you've told me that you've shot all of Hawkeye's arrows in one turn. So No, I know someone who has, though. It's true. But not me. <laughs> Was it a solo game? Probably. But I wouldn't... Why would you ever shoot more than one arrow? Well, that's a different episode. <laughs> well, not directly related to solo play, we do have a special episode of the card text to insert here at the end of our regular episode talking all about in-play and out-of-play interactions. After that, we'll get back with Corey and talk about where you can find more information on the Solo Champions League. Welcome to the Card Text, an unofficial mini-podcast about Marvel Champions at the LCG. We cover rules discussions regarding gameplay and aim to help fans of the game better understand the inner workings of their favorite Marvel card game. So I have to jump in here and mention two things. One, we missed talking about the uses keyword. Cards with the uses keyword in general will have entered play and will be removed from play and enter a discard pile after its last counter is removed and after its ability fully resolves. Basically, it will be snatched by the collector's interrupt. Secondly, a short while after we recorded the episode, we received an email about a card from Gamora's pack, which can actually occupy a very uncommon third state of play which is neither in nor out of play. Doesn't change a whole lot for the episode, but it is something we wanted to mention. Thanks. Welcome to episode five of The Card Text. I'm Bob, joined here by Theorel and Scott. Hello, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing in play, out of play. What elements are in play? What elements are out of play? We'll also be discussing, I think, to a larger degree, the upcoming collector scenario from Galaxy's Most Wanted. A lot of people want to know what cards exactly that affects and to what extent that mechanism will impact cards and gameplay. I have a list, but I think, Scott, you put on one of our bullet points here that cards exist in either one state or another. It's either in play or out of play. I don't think there's an in-between, right? No, no, not really. They're either in play or they're not. <laughs> and if they're not, they're out of play. It's it's actually pretty simple. Okay, and you did you did bring up the events there. Yeah, I mean they they explicitly resolve from out of play. Yeah, and they they never actually enter play. And I think I think that's part of their their streamlining of the rules. Um, and in this case, I think it's actually a, a good thing. So I did have a list, just so the listeners have that concrete list of things that are in play and out of play. So stuff that is out of play. We have the player hand, whatever cards are in your hand are out of play, your player deck, your discard pile, the encounter deck is out of play, 
you encounter discard piles out of play, unrevealed cards in the villain deck. Uh, for example, if you're playing Rhino in Standard, that stage one uh, will be in play, but the stage two underneath him is the unrevealed card and that is out of play. Main scheme cards that are underneath a main scheme card that is in play are out of play. Set aside cards are out of play. Cards that are removed from the game are out of play. One thing I might add to that is the, is dealt face down cards. Face down boost card or a face down encounter card that's been dealt also be out of play. Those are also out of play. Thank you, Thea. Stuff that is in play. So those are mainly non-event cards that have been played or put into play. So those are things like upgrades, allies, support cards. The top card of the villain deck is in play. The top card of the main scheme deck is in play. Uh, site schemes, minions, attachments. And environments as well. Obligations? The ones that stick around. I'm not so sure about the ones that don't. So it's... As far as I know, Caleb, like the only thing we have about obligations and whether they're in play out of play is he said obligations as a card type enter play. I don't know if that really applies to like the core set stuff. That does seem like a relevant thing to resolve regarding uh, the collector. Right. So we would have to hear back from the developers that these actually enter play for a significant enough period that it would, you know, interact with. Maybe only Strange's obligation enters play. Yeah, for sure, Strange, um, his obligation can enter play. So that's the list, uh, as best we can put it together, of in-play, out-of-play stuff. The obligations we're obviously going to need a little more clarification on. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the Collector. From the upcoming Galaxy's Most Wanted, the Collector, the villain, stage one, reads, he's an elder, as far as traits are concerned. Forced to interrupt, when a card player or encounter would be placed into a discard pile from play put it face up into the collection instead the only shot we have of his main scheme called the grand collection 10 uh, threshold for threat it's got an action which says a hero action choose to either exhaust your hero or spend two resources of any type cost arrow discard one card from the collection to its owner's discard pile limit once per player per round and then it has bold text if there are at least five per player cards in the collection or if this stage is completed the players lose the game so a character like black widow one of the questions that may come up is do preparation cards still trigger if they end up in the collection. In particular, Black Widow's preparations clearly are going to be going into the collection because they are in play, and then when you trigger them, you discard them. So they are a card which are being placed into a discard pile from play, and therefore the collector puts them in his collection. I think the question is, because the collector put that card into his collection, have you, have you successfully paid the cost? I lean towards it being true, that it would work. The card is discarded from play. It just doesn't hit your discard pile goes straight to the collection so if a card didn't hit the discard pile was it really discarded because that's a question that everybody wants to know the answer to yeah so just it's just going to hinge on them saying yeah if you discard from play that's good enough to meet the uh, condition there the cost on a preparation card i think the part that collector's ability replaces is the card entering the discard pile not it being discarded so you are still considered to have discarded the card and therefore paid the cost. That, that's the way I feel about it too. All right. So next question in regard to the collector scenario. Can make the call play an ally from the collection? No. The collection is not your discard pile. So make the call specifically targets any player's discard pile. The collection is not mentioned in Make the Call, therefore it doesn't interact with the collection's discard pile or the the collection. The the collection in particular maybe is not a discard pile. Uh, right, right. I think it's going to be just the collection, a set of cards that we don't know whether it, they're in play or out of play at this point, but they are not a discard pile, I think. They need to be out of play, because otherwise the collector would immediately place them in his collection whenever you... That's true. Yes, they must be out of play. So next question, can you play Lockjaw from the collection? No, same, same reason. It's Lockjaw is, it's basically you play him from your discard pile. The collection isn't your discard pile, so you can't use his ability. 
Following question, do defeated villain or main scheme stages end up in the collection? That one's going to be a no, because they're going to go to a different out of play area. They're removed from the game. So it doesn't count. Uh, next question, can a rapid response prevent an ally from being put into the collection? No. Rapid response is after an ally you control is defeated, discard rapid response, put that ally into play from your discard pile and deal one damage to it. So it seems that with rapid response, the card actually has to enter the discard pile for you to be able to pull it back. But if the collector is out, that can't actually happen, right? Yeah, yeah, because collector's ability interrupts that process, stops it from entering the discard pile, puts it into the collection instead. Okay, next question. What cards can avoid being sent to the collection? In general, if a card were going to avoid going to the collection, it would require there to be an interrupt that prevents it from going to the discard pile. Okay, we have a couple of examples of that. All of the examples we've got are allies. So one example is Clear, protection ally. I mean, she has the ability interrupt. When Clear is defeated, shuffle her into her owner's deck. That kicks in before Collector's ability, because it's when she's defeated, when that process of defeat starts, and then you shuffle her into your, your deck, and therefore she never goes into your discard pile, and therefore collector's ability never triggers. So the next one is Red Dagger, uh, which is Ms. Marvel's um, signature ally. His ability is interrupt. When Red Dagger is defeated, spend two resources of different types and deal two damage to an enemy and return Red Dagger to your hand. Similarly to clear, his interrupt triggers when the defeat process starts. Assuming you have the two resources of different types to spend, you can pay those, deal the damage, he comes back to your hand, he never hits your discard pile, and therefore collector's ability never triggers putting you in the collection. The next one is Hellcat, She-Hulk's signature ally. This one is slightly different in that it doesn't interrupt the defeat process because her ability is action return hellcat to your hand so this is something you've got to do preemptively it's not a, a reactive thing um, you've got to be in the position where you can see that hellcat is going to get discarded at some point in the near future you take the action to return her to your hand the, the final ally that we we know can avoid being collected is Mockingbird, the signature ally version from Hawkeye's deck. And her ability is interrupt. When the villain initiates an attack against you, spend one resource of any type and return Mockingbird to your hand. Prevent all damage from this attack. So again, like Hellcat, it's not something that reactively stops the collection from happening. It's something where you've got to proactively do something that prevents her from ending up getting collected. Um, effectively, her ability is like blocking with her. And yeah, instead, you're just spending a resource and bringing her back to handing and you just prevent the damage. In order for the, these cards to work the way we just said, that does mean that there has to be some kind of a distinction between those the defeat and the place into discard pile Clea and for uh, Red Dagger, a defeat includes a discard, which implicitly includes placing the card into the discard pile, which is the point where the collector's interrupt, forced interrupt happens. The interrupt, the defeat, can take precedence over the forced interrupt of the place in discard pile. Looking at these abilities, it must be, uh, as Theo said, two distinct things, otherwise... It doesn't seem to work. It's worth noting that I, I don't think we've had a distinction between those two before. Now we have the other hard question. Are cards attached to other cards, specifically Bruno and Hawkeye's Quiver, considered in play? And then second half of that question then, do they count for the collector's ability? Right. Yeah, because they're attached. Attached cards are in play. That's the first bullet point under attached to full reference page three. Once a card is attached, it remains in play until either the element it is attached to leaves play, in which case the attached card is discarded, or an ability or game effect causes the attached card to leave play. So yeah. It's possible that Bruno's cards are not considered to be in play. This would go back to the thing the side schemes 
marked for death, which has Mockingbird placed face up underneath it, and she is in play. And then we have the Hydra Prison, which has the allies placed face down. It seems like they are not in play. They're, neither of them use the word attach. They both use place under. Whereas, whereas Bruno does use the word attach. Bruno uses the word attach, but it's possible that they intend it to be that face down cards are not in play. Face up cards are in play and that the attach part is not maybe the important element to that. I think the rules say they are, but I don't think that they meant them to be. We're just going to have to settle on being um, uncertain as to whether those cards are in play or not and affected by the collector's collection. Yeah. Yeah, until we get a ruling on it. Fortunately for Bruno and the collector side, that's not as important because those cards don't leave play very much. Yeah, I can't remember which treachery it is, but there is one that causes you to discard a, I think it's support or upgrade. So cutoff card could hit Bruno. You could be in the in the situation where the only persona you have out is Bruno and your obligation comes up. And in that situation, yeah, it's not clear whether the cards under Bruno would go to the collection or not. But then if they're not, where do they go? Because <laughs> Well, they would just go to your discard pile if they weren't considered to be in play, right? Not a problem with cards entering your discard pile. I think the whole attach in play thing is supposed to be really for upgrades. It's cards that you've played that end up attached to things. It, like that, that feels to me like the intended target for that, not guys quiver maybe it's a templating problem maybe attach was just the wrong word to use there i i think that you are correct rules is written i think rules is written are clear <laughs> there's really no other way to read it it's just I think it's wrong if yeah if the, if the arrows onto quiver are in play then that actually makes quiver really bad because that is the only way events are ever going to end up in the collection so don't use the quiver if you play hawkeye against the collector so let's let's do just a real a quick recap. So for Bruno, in terms of playing against the collector, if you play Bruno as Ms. Marvel and Bruno gets discarded from play, uh, either via treachery or some other card that we don't know about yet, what is the player advised to do by by us? Rules as written, any cards under Bruno go to the collection. And we feel more strongly about the qui the quiver, right? The arrows on the quiver, whether it's after you play them or if something happens to remove an event attached to the quiver or if something removes the quiver itself, then those cards all go to the collection. I I, I agree. I think those are the rules as written. Yeah, pending further clarification um, about all that. So that concludes the episode of In Play, Out of Play. I did want to mention uh, thanks to Mr. L and Scarlet Rhodey both for uh, the input for this episode. Um, hopefully we covered those questions. Let us know if we did address them. If we didn't, let us know uh, on our Discord or at the Card Text Podcast at Gmail. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Theo. Thanks for everything you do for this. Yeah. Cheers. We hope that was informative. Thanks to Kennedy Hawk and everyone at Marvel Champions Monthly for graciously hosting us. Tune in for our next episode next month on the latest rulings, news, and rules conundrums. Thanks to my distinguished colleagues, uh, Theo Rell and Scott, for joining. And remember, when you would rather not read the rules reference, listen to the card text instead. No, that was all we had for today. So thanks a lot for coming on, Corey. We will say again, make sure you check out the Solo Champions League. I know I'm going to be doing it again in Season 5. And I'm going to try to talk these other two people in the chat room here into doing it as well. And we'll see how many of us... I just joined the Discord server. Boom, it's that easy. Okay, good. Nice. <laughs> so Corey, tell us again, where can people find out and sign up for the Solo Champions League? Yeah, it's a bearoverinsmith.com. And uh, just click the Solo Champions League at the top of the page. There's a join the Discord button right there. It's perfect. We're good to go. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be back in two weeks.